All right, yeah, you guys are going to look up that post, who's got my money. You're going to read through those questions, and I mean, like, actually read through them, do some thinking, get into that mindset, right? That's super important. Okay, here's what's cool about this crowd being smaller than the past, is that we've got a little bit more time to go deep. So we're going to do that. All right, let's get moving. Okay, super important. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever raised $3.5 million before. No takers? Okay. Raise your hand if you've raised $3.5 million in the last 72 hours. All right. So, so now, now we know where we're at. And I didn't get to raise my hand on that one. Sweet. Sweet. Come on in. Join, join. All right. Make sure that you guys have read that Who's Got My Money post. It's got a bunch of questions. We're going to get right into this. With real raisers, people that have raised money before. All right, guys. So there's kind of a North Star that I have. I kind of would say that Michael here shares that. I never called Michael before. That was, that was weird. I don't know if I like that. I'm going to go back to Mike. You know, when you do something for 10 years, it feels good. You just got to stick with it, you know? All right. So uh, the North Star that we care about, and I want you guys to ask yourself if this sounds like a position you want to be in, okay? We're gonna really get focused on this. We're, we're, we're here to play the long game. We're not here just for what's happening tomorrow or next week with your venture. What we love is to see founders become funders. We call them founder funders. And what this is, is you exit your company, you take some of the risk off the table, you have a liquidity event, maybe you keep your company, there's a lot of ways for that to happen. But what happens is you end up having a decision to make. I don't know if this thing's actually working. And that decision that you get to make is, do I do it again, which is awesome, or do I invest? And what the data shows us is that you invest in your region, predominantly. And so you become the rocket fuel, you become the support, you become the inspiration, we could say Michael Jordan, or maybe we should say Sarah Blakely, you know, of the region that you're in, and you get to start the cycle to do. So just understand this process, whether you feel like you're raising now, you're raising in the future, you're always raising for the opportunity to build those capital relationships, right? So that that's not confusing. You're going to hear some things, come on in gentlemen. You're gonna hear some things today you've never heard before about capital and fundraising. Our goal is for you guys to walk away with a completely new perspective on how capital works, how capital allocators and investors think, and how you can join and become an angel investor or something like that in the future because of your success with your current company. That's why we're here. That's what we care about. You are the X factor, right? At the end of the day, you're the most important ingredient in the startup ecosystem and in startups. Another thing we're gonna to talk to you about is an alternative track. Mike's gonna represent a new way of doing VC, and I'm going to represent, as an experienced VC as well, an alternative track that you can consider. This is not to say that the VC track is a bad one. It's just simply think of an idea of running two parallel tracks as you're fundraising. One that's a little bit more traditional. You go to angels, you go to VCs, great, especially if that's a match for your business model. And then second, the, the purpose of you reading that Who's Got My Money post is to get you into this framework that there's a ridiculous amount of capital. You can't even wrap your head around the amount of capital that's available for your venture. It all comes down to you as a badass, showing up in an energy that enrolls and attracts capital allocators to say, I want to do this with you. All right, we're going to get right into it because we're here to do the game show today. We're going to switch things up a little bit. Who is ready to come be in the hot seat and do some venture capital trivia? <laughs> venture capital trivia. Don't raise your hand all at one time. James, get up here, buddy. All right, all right, all right. Here we go, here we go, here we go. We're gonna move fast, we're gonna move fast. We've got a lot, of, a lot of content to cover. We're here to serve you guys today. All right, so check this out. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna go through a lot of things that you probably have assumed been taught incorrectly or, uh, or have kind of just had a limited viewpoint on how capital actually works. And we're gonna see if we can dispel some of those, those rumors. Okay, can you name any of the top three states that most of the capital moves through. For venture capital, this is through the venture capital model. I want to be clear, a little clarifier. Seattle? Seattle? Seattle. Not bad. I'll give you one more guess. Um, Texas? 
close. Top four. Uh, Top states are Silicon Valley versus California, as we all know. Second would be New York and Boston. 75% traditionally speaking in the aggregate over time for venture capital. And once you start making distinctions of capital types, we're here to talk about all these different capital types. Traditionally speaking, 75% has come through those three. Now this is good news to all you that are thinking, crap, I'm in Vegas, this is bad news. No, it's not. Because we're gonna help you to understand where all the other capital is hiding so that we can find out who, who's got my money? All right. <laughs> Coming up, who moves the majority of the, the capital that moves into ventures in the United States? Trick question, kind of, because we just want to do this. We have a question. Right? Okay, give it, give it your best shot. If you were to name one of the three major parties that allocates capital, who would it be? Uh, am I talking generally like VC funding or private funding? Just do whatever comes to mind. We're going to keep this quick. Uh, VC funding. Okay, wrong. Wrong. And that's probably the answer most of you guys came up with, right? Let me put it another way. Who writes the checks? If you guys understand how VC works, there's a general partner who puts a little bit of skin in the game or no skin in the game, and they raise from LPs, limited partners, and who are those? And I'm gonna give you the answer right now. The answer is private equity firms who have the majority of the capital, family offices, which is a fancy term for, I'm a founder funder that exited minimum of 50 to 100 million dollars, and now I want to do it again. And then last but not least would be the Fortune 2000, actually. The Fortune 2000, those big bank accounts that they're sitting on. Okay, not doing so hot yet, James. Come on, man. We need a mountain bike on. I'll, I'll slip you the answers. Okay, cool. The best kind of capital for my business is? Um, we're talking capital types then, right? Uh, free capital. Uh, okay. He's <laughs> like, I'm gonna go with three, right? I'm gonna go with three. Okay. Cool. So this is a trick question also. The right kind of capital for me is whatever capital is available that matches my business model at this time. Okay? Now we're gonna get into what those are, but there is a break to you is the trick part. There is no perfect capital out there. And the reason is all capital has strings, all capital has relationships, all capital has expectations. A smart fundraising fluent founder knows when to grab from the spectrum of available capital options and to play the right card at the right time. And I know that's complex, and we're working on facing that, but that is the current setup. Okay, one more, and then we're gonna switch over to Mike and a new contestant. How many times should I be prepared to pitch? How many times should I, I'm going, I'm raising capital. How many times should I be prepared to pitch? Kurt, what's the average amount of times that I think I'm gonna be prepared mentally to pitch if I'm really gonna fuel my company with outside capital instead of funding it through clients and customer income? You're right. always pitching. Okay, always pitching is a really good answer. It might be better than the answer I was gonna come up with. Give me a number, give me a number. A um, hundred. A hundred is right. Yeah. All the big dogs you guys revere. I don't, I don't know, so we used, we used Sarah Blakely before, if you guys knew what this woman went through to get to the point where she built Spanx, and he probably knows better because him and Jesse are tight, uh, Sarah's husband that built Mad Jets, um, and he's crazy. He's a wild man. Yes. Okay. Mike is up next. Okay. Next contestant. Next contestant. Thanks, James. Come on up. Come on up. I'll do whatever, I'll do the due diligence, and the answer is yes. 
The reason why this is a really big misunderstanding is because you're never going to use one capital type to fund your business. That's one of the things we want you guys to take away from today. So you're never going to use one capital type. Really quick for those of you that aren't quite clicking and tracking on what we're talking about. Pretend you're a real estate investor and you're about to do a $100 million deal. If you ever hear these guys pitch, it's awesome. They'll go to the city and they'll be like, look, we have $16 million of this kind of funding and it's this capital type. Then we have tax abatement money and it's this capital type, that's $8 million. Then they're like, oh, we're over here and we're doing, oh, we're gonna do a mortgage for this piece at $7 million. Oh, and then we have a little bit of hard money or some money down out of our own pocket. That's, that's like $12 million, right? So by the time they've gotten to the sixth or seventh capital type comes the ask. And city, if you just give us $13 million, we can complete this project. They come saying, hey, we have friends. They come saying we have all these different capital types. Now, if you're a developer, you've heard this song and dance to a $100 million deal all the time because this is how it's done. What people don't realize in funding startups is this is also how the biggest companies in the world are funded. You just don't know that. And it's not just about multiple VCs, it's about multiple capital types outside of VC. And again, VCs are not bad. They're awesome if it's the right VC for your business model, right? Okay, moving on. Investors invest for this main reason. This main reason. <laughs> Hard to argue with that. That's, that's true. That was an assist. You didn't even have to phone a friend. Yeah. Okay, what else? What do you got? Uh, believe it or not, that is true if it's the right kind of investor that's a founder funder because they got lots of money burning a hole in their pocket. Um, I don't know that there's a wrong answer, and this is a highly specific situation, but I would say that they, they invest usually for the founder. They're, they're betting on the, the jockey, not the horse. It's really about the person and their will, their uh, the ability they have to transfer that confidence in what they're doing. Can this person get the ball in the end zone? It's almost universally most VCs or most money allocators, most whatever, comes down to who's going to get it. Okay, this one's really important. Name the four types of capital. If I were to take the 35 different types of capital and put them into four nice little cute boxes for you guys so you can wrap your head around how this works, what would the four be? No wrong answers. High interest. High interest, okay. That sounds like a, a loan. Okay, cool. Okay, so the first one is debt. There's, a, there's four different types of debt. We won't get into that now, but debt is one. It's awesome when you don't want to give up equity, but it's not awesome when you have a timeline and you're building something, so you better be cash flowing if you take on debt, okay? Revenue, okay. That's my favorite one, we'll come back to that. He said revenue, okay. Oh man, on a roll, equity. All right, equity would be angel money, investment money. Anytime somebody's doing a partnership with you where they're saying, hey, we're partners now, I either have a board seat or I have equity in your company, that's equity. Now this is the one you guys tend to focus on but what you don't realize is there's a, a larger spread of individuals that actually do these kinds of deals that don't necessarily do these terms. Okay, what else? What's that lead? Yes, so we call we call grant money public and gov funds. So anytime you're getting money from the government or in your own pocket from taxes, I should say, that's, that's, that's public and gov funds. Now the one that's most interesting that you should focus on is what we call raised revenue or sponsored capital. This is when you get someone from the Fortune 2000, from the founder funder lot, from the uh, private equity side, or from the family office side to write you a check. Now this is the mind bender that you're gonna have a hard time understanding. They're writing you a check because they believe in you and they believe in the outcome that you can produce. With this kind of deal, because they can also write you a venture check sometimes and that's gonna come with equity strings, but when we're talking about if it comes into the company not as debt, and it comes into the company not as equity, what is it from an accounting standpoint? Revenue. It's revenue. I'll give you an example. I-15, Salt Lake City. There is a billboard that's black and it says, on white letters it says Pura, P-U-R-A. The first half million dollars that came into that company was stroked by a larger fragrance company and it was not debt and it was not equity. What is it? It is revenue. Now, these are not the easiest deals in the world to pull off, but they happen every single day. And so it's important that you guys understand that there's a whole lane of traffic that feels like an investment that actually is revenue. We call this sponsored capital or when you go out and raise revenue. Kurt, what's the difference between when I get my customers to fund my business? 
Those are checks of 20,000, 30,000. I'll give you an example. We have a, a, a founder in New York that's building a diverse business, an AI attachment, it's pretty cool. The AI sits in your meeting and, and lets you know if you're being toned in, essentially. Uh, she's like, Kurt, I'm talking to uh, Reebok. I'm talking to Estee Lauder. And I'm like, you're talking to the wrong people. She goes, what do you mean? I'm about to get a check for 20 grand, 30 grand. I'm like, that's awesome, take it. Go find out who in the organization will allocate and fund you as a startup through revenue. And they'll show you a check, 300K, 500K, or more. Estee Lauder does this all the time, okay? So, okay, so those are the four. Super important. I know it gets more granular than that, but just wanted to break that down. Okay, last but not least. <laughs> this is a fun one. Venture capital began in A, Boston. B, Silicon Valley in the 1950s. C, for extra credit, the 1200s with the Dutch. Or D, turn of the century in the United States. What's the answer? I'll give you two again. Boston. Silicon Valley in the 50s, 1200s with the Dutch, and turn of the century here in the United States. A, a strong argument can be made that the Dutch were the first real entrepreneur merchants that we have. So I actually like that answer a lot. That's not the answer I'm going for as far as what's closest to the model that exists today. This whole crazy idea of Estee Lauder writing a check without asking for equity is older than the current venture capital model that started in the 50s in Silicon Valley. If you guys go study the semi semiconductor industry, you will find a pattern of companies funding other companies using their balance sheets to do it, and it's not equity all the time. So in my opinion, and I don't want to get sidetracked with this, the right answer is the turn of the century. The first real venture capital guys were the Robert Barons. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Jay Gould, E.A. Chairman, these guys were writing checks. Put yourself in their perspective. They own monopolies. They own entire industries and all the industries that related to them. How do you make a return when you own everything? You create your own buyers. You put money out and you say, if it is mine for my supply chain, I give you money, I'm creating more clients than my own. And if you guys study that time in history, you'll know what I'm talking about is true. They were the first VCs. So Bessemer Capital is one of the oldest VC firms in the world, and they're based on the East Coast. So there you go. Thanks for coming out, man. All right. You ready to roll? Hey everyone, thanks for being here first of all. Uh, 15 minutes ago I had an alarm go off every day at 11, 11 I had this alarm go off. And uh, the label on your the alarm, which I encourage you all to do, is stop breathing and be grateful. So while Kurt was talking, that went on. So I'd love to just do that real quick because we've got a little bit more time together. So let's all just take a moment. Get nice and comfortable in your seat. And I know your mind may be thinking about a bunch of things that are happening in your business, in your family, all kinds of crazy things happening. Just take a moment, take a deep breath in, and a nice slow breath out. And as you open your eyes, just kind of look around the room real quick and notice how amazing this is, that there's a community being built around startups, tech, venture capital, that you're surrounded by people passionate about the same things that you are. So I just want to say that I'm grateful to be here. I wasn't initially planning on being here, but after Kurt said, hey, come talk to people about venture, as Kurt mentioned, this has been a kind of a pretty monumental last week. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. So my, my intention, just as like a quick pause, this is like a commercial break between the game show, is, um, Work from our sponsors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, is to say, uh, my intention is when you leave this room in 45 minutes, that you are a better founder, a better builder, a better capital allocator, just a better human being, and you have more tools in your tool belt, that you have a better understanding of the whole startup and funding landscape, and that you're just better for having been here. So that's my goal. I'm gonna try to be as helpful as possible with sharing like resources. I obviously have my own biases as a former founder, current capital allocator, so those will come out over the next 45 minutes, but just sharing that with you. I hope that Kurt and I can pour as much into you as possible and leave enough time for everyone to like have their questions answered around everything, venture, capital allocation, raising funding. So I just want to do a quick level set and then I'll hand it back off to Kurt for, for the game show. 
How many people have ever gone out and actually raised capital on their own? Okay. How many want to go out at some point in their business and go out and raise capital? Okay. So it, this may be a review for some of you, but for others, it's going to be brand new. So I just want to really quickly kind of tell you the life cycle of starting a business and how like the funding process works, right? The quick background on me, the 30 seconds, is I spent five years on active duty as a Marine. I spent 10 years doing the founder journey. I had some wins. I've known Kurt for a very long time. He's seen some of those wins. I transitioned from the founder side to the investor side to the angel investing for a number of years. I'm your founder. Founder, founder. I ended up launching a startup accelerator, which I still run, uh, the world's largest startup accelerator founder institute. I mentioned with Techstars, if you're familiar with them. And at the beginning of last year, I launched a venture capital fund, and we're very active right now, seven portfolio companies, two more in the next few weeks. So this is like my world inside and out, just so you know. Let's talk about the quick life cycle of businesses because I know this is zero to one and most companies are kind of in that space and then I'll hand it off to you in two minutes here. You start a business, you have an idea. As you start getting up and going from the funding part of it, you're initially doing it on your own, right? You're funding it yourself. Maybe putting things on credit cards, maybe going out, and then, but everything is within your ecosystem, right? Now all of a sudden you're starting to validate, hey, there's something here, I need to go out and raise my first little bit of capital. Where do you typically go? Where's the founder go? That's right, F, F, and F. You haven't heard that before. It's friends, family, and fools. You say fools. It's, like, it's the people that are crazy enough to say, hey, I believe in this founder. You pretty much just have an idea. I'm gonna give you money. They're really, maybe they're looking for returns, but they really are believing and supporting you, right? You use some of that capital that you have available, you get going a little bit more, and then you go out and you start raising what we call OPM, other people's money. What is generally that next round after friends, family, and fools? That's right, angel investors. So angel investors are making their own decisions. They are all individuals that will write checks as small as maybe $5,000 up to some angels, right? 100 to probably 250 is the most that they'll go. The funding cycle on those is much shorter though. You'll see as it gets later down the pipeline, the diligence process becomes much longer. But the angels are making their own choice in their investments, right? As Kurt talked about, they feel values a lot. They believe in you as a founder, the mission of what you're building, what you're doing. But you do need to have something there. Again, short sales cycle generally, because they'll make a decision pretty quickly about whether they like you or not. It's their choice. They're personally writing a check for you. After angels, where do you go? And again, we're kind of talking the traditional venture fund model, not the other types of capital that are available. Now you go out, and this is venture. Now this is, again, like this is it's this black box that I'm, I'm very grateful that there are more resources coming out about how to approach this world and how venture works. But then you would come to a firm like mine that does early stage investing. And just so everyone's on the same page, the first round that you raise after your kind of friends and family angel in the venture model is your pre-seed, then your seed, series C, then your series A, series B, and all the way down the road. When you're going out and raising three seed capital from a firm, this is where you need to have everything tightened up. Every firm is investing, as Kurt mentioned. You have the GPs running the firm and you have the LPs, the limited partners, as the investors. For example, I as the GP of my fund, we are fiduciaries, we are responsible for returning capital to our investor base. Kurt just talked about it. We raised another 3.5 million this last week from LPs that wanted to put more money into the fund. That's a great thing for us, but that's also more responsibility. I say that because, and Kurt will talk about this as we get to the questions, you need to understand the incentives of the different capital allocators you're talking to, right? We are fiduciaries to our LP base, so when we make investment decisions, it's what's best really for our base, obviously with an investment thesis alignment and all of that. So that's the end of my kind of commercial break. I'll probably do another one a little bit later, but I just want to level set. So was that helpful for everyone to understand like how that model works? Okay, commercial break over, back to the game show, and then we'll all be back. Awesome. Woo. All right, who's ready, who's ready? I didn't speak to like hedge funding and, and where that ties in. Well, let's get to that later, yeah. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna do Q&A later. Okay, who's ready, come up here. All right, come up here, Judy, Judy right? All right. All right, all right. Okay, how many customers should I talk to before I'm ready to pitch? At least one minute. 
Wow, one million. Well, she's serious about her startup. But, but seriously, guys, you do need to be willing to understand fundraising strategy before you go throw up on everybody else. And what also comes before pitching, in my opinion, if you've done it right, is that you've talked to at least, what I call it, 100 first tries. Don't come to me and tell me you've talked to less than 100 customers. And I don't mean your mom, right? Because you get the feedback, you get the pricing, you get the understanding of the articulation of your value statement in that practice. And then you come to the table much more prepared. Now there's also nothing wrong with doing a lot of pitching to different investors to gain confidence and strength and to be particular about when in that cycle you choose to go to the ones you think are a really good fit because you kind of want to make sure you've got things really tightened up because at the end of the day, this may be the only opportunity you have to present to them. So 100 times minimum, 100 clients. And seriously, when founders, I can t we can tell when they haven't talked to 100 clients, always. All right, let's see here. The largest source of capital is, the largest source of capital is. <clears throat> Where's the majority of the money that's available for venture? What is that, what's the biggest pool? I, I, I've, already, I've already asked this question, I'm doing it again. It is private. I, if we wanted to use one answer, we'd say private equity. Now, that gets a little confusing because if most private equity does real estate transactions, things like that, they're a lot more secure. But just know if we were to go look at a, at a pie chart, just so you can wrap your head around this. In 2021, we had $330 billion moving from traditional venture into startups. 2022, that number went down, and unfortunately, that number is about to go down again this year through traditional venture. It's going to be down in the 100 60 billion range or something like that. It doesn't mean the money is not still there though, because again, we've already covered this idea that the LPs are the ones sitting on all the cash. I'm already hearing of private equity firms, family offices and Fortune 2000s going shopping for distressed assets, which is another way of saying we can buy things at a discount because we have all the money. And if you want to understand how much money we're talking about, it is for all intents and purposes unlimited. Our team, I consider us like capital forensics. We've uncovered like $5.4 trillion worth of capital that's moving back for it to ventures into the deal core that is available. So that's just, awesome. just know, just know that it, it's up to you. If the reason you're not funded, it's, it's your fault, pretty much. Either you don't have the education or you haven't taken the time to really understand. And I get that that's tough because there isn't a lot of education for this. But just know that the, the VCs are not the problem. There are bad VCs, but that's not the majority. VCs have a specific model, and it may not match what you're trying to do or the stage in which you're trying to invest. Okay, I was going to say, it's time that everybody's back. Uh, <laughs> she's, got, she's got the best answers. She's got the best answers. Investors buy this the most. A, the story. B, the founder. C, the timing. And D, the contracts for cash flow that you have. A, the story. No, what's my question? Oh. Investors buy this the most. The story, the narrative, B, the founder, C, the timing in the market, and D, contracts for cash flow that you have. Revenue agreements. Founder. Founder. I, I think that's, these are all pretty good answers, by the way. But that's, that's probably the one that, again, most VCs are gonna go for early. Yeah, early stage. Uh, as, as Mike just pointed out, that won't get you to, a, especially in this current market, it won't help you as much with pre-seed. It won't help you with, some of the later things. But it is always the founder at the end of the day. The investor's looking at that founder saying, can you get that ball in the hole for each additional round? And if they invested with you in the past and you haven't been great at performance, they might be thinking, how do we replace you? Uh, you know, or, or would I do another deal without this person being replaced? But we'll talk about that later because that's not super, super common. Okay. The time to be raising capital is? Always. Yesterday, yesterday, yeah, yesterday. yesterday. Yes. Now what we mean by raising is, is you need to always be building those relationships and be out in front of them, making an impression so that they're like, oh, mental note, okay, great. VCs are not funding as much right now, so the money is all dried up, true or false? The VCs are not funding, okay, great, that's correct. <laughs> if I could just get my hands on a list of investors, I'm all set. No. How many times have you heard this? How many times do we get hit up because you haven't practiced with 100 customers first. Because you haven't taken the time 
to have a strategy around how you're raising. And you're just, it's a spray and pray model. You're embarrassing yourself. You're taking somebody that could be an asset for the future. Because guys, there is no computer, at least for the foreseeable future in venture, this is good news, that is making a decision to allocate capital to you. It is a human being that is writing that check. So when I tell you it's up to you, it really is up to you. So you have to ask yourself, dig deep and say, am I, am I good enough? Am I showing up as good enough? This isn't a conversation about your worth as a human being. This is a conversation around, am I prepared? Have I done the work? Have I done the research? Have I done the interviews? Have I done the work, the, the, the level of work that is required for me to show up? And they're like, this person knows their crap inside and out, and they're, they're gonna be able to adapt to what's required to go through this startup journey. May I add something? Absolutely. When we talk about money, then you cannot be a dreamer. Even John Lennon said, be a dreamer. Yeah. Because money is not just about the money. That's right. Okay, me being a diverse founder, this is a, this is a touchy one. Me being a diverse founder, female, from a poor, or a female from a poor neighborhood means I won't get funded. True or false? False. False. In some ways and in some circles and with some allocators, you being diverse is actually a very large positive. Whether they actually believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion as we call DEI or not, it's very hot. Now, yes, there's some pullback on that, but again, if you're an amazing founder that happens to check some boxes that are in alignment with an initiative they have, you're, you're more likely to get funded. All right, giving away equity is bad. Debt is bad. No. Wrong. That's right. That's right. Good debt, bad debt. Right. You know, VCs, a great VC, the question you should be asking yourself to a VC is, is this person bringing a lot more than their money? Because their money is the least valuable thing that they bring. They're coming with the network. They're coming with, uh, I would say that uh, Bill Burley at, at Benchmark that drove Airbnb, drove Uber, uh, drove all these about WeWork, which is a really bad example. <laughs> it's a horrible founder in my opinion. Uh, but long story short, I would say Bill Gurley was part of the X Factor of some of those ventures. He, he showed up in a way that proves that there are great VCs out there when it comes to supporting the founders. All right. The most important input into the business is founder one, two, capital, three, team, four, clients. A team is closely following the founder, and if the founder's not awesome, there will be no team following them. So just understand that. Later stages, that we are buying the team quite a bit. All right, the thing that affects the outcome of the startup the most is timing. The founder, number three, the team, or four, the capital stack. I don't know. It's always the founder and the team. Or guys, I hate to admit this, but I've looked at the data, Timing matters a great deal, especially if you're building something big. It matters in your ability to raise based on who's willing to allocate. It matters as is the market and the wind sails to your back. The timing is very important. So as you do your research, make sure you understand that you can articulate to a funder, why me and why now? Why I'm the person to do this and why now is the time and you have to really know your stuff. Super important because timing unfortunately is a much bigger deal than founders give credit to. Yeah, you can either have the wind in your back, you can have it in your face, and it's no fun when it is. If an investor or relationship doesn't give me a referral or fund me right this second, they're no use to me. True or false? false? Can't tell you how often I hear this on LinkedIn from people, or they, they hear a talk, or they read a piece, and they're hitting me up to be introduced. Have they even shown me they're a founder worth introducing? We're all human beings. None of us want to introduce anybody to somebody else that's going to make us look bad. And in fact, much of the venture capital ecosystem is built on referrals. If you don't come through to me, through somebody I trust, I don't, I'm not gonna take your call. That's part of their due diligence process, whether that's good or bad, sometimes it's either. So just know that. Play the long game. Always be seeking, I call it discovery, to understand what's important to them. So maybe it's doing your homework. If they're an established fund that does VC, find out what their thesis is. Find out if you're even a match. Now here's where it gets tricky with sponsored capital and this other stuff. You have to be really creative. Maybe you find out that the founder has a brother that has massive seizures all the time. Do you think that guy who has hundreds of millions of dollars might be willing to write a sweetheart check to something that's gonna help that, even if they're not investing, they're actually doing revenue? Absolutely. There are groups out there that stroke checks because they love female founders. And they'll, they'll write enormous checks, right? So it's all about finding that angle. But treat these people like people. It's an actual relationship. You have to care about the person. And I want to be clear here, they're not buying the interest in your company, this, this type of investment. 
investor. They're buying the outcome that you produce. So your job is to go in, do discovery, and find the shared outcome, the alignment, where they show up a check for a million dollars or more. You can provide what, they, what they're looking for, that outcome, and everybody's happy. Okay? Super, super important. You were talking about that in the commercial. Where's the B? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's a great example. All right, Judy, thank you. Thank you. We've got the Come up, come up, come up. All right, come up, everybody. Say hi to Gary. That was me. Say hi to Gary. 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 The most scarce resource a founder needs to find and develop is capital. The most scarce resource a finder needs to develop and find is capital. I'm going to say it's time. Interesting. That, that, I don't know if there's a wrong answer here. I'm going to go with uh, it's the founder's way of being that matters more than anything else. Is it connected to a greater purpose? Have they done the work to really understand the problem? Have they found a problem in the world that they will not give up on? The, the, the general energy is until, right? And they're willing to do the work. And you know, when I mean the work, I mean the work on themselves. Guys, build, building a startup, especially a venture type startup, is not a small business. This is this is not something you're building to a couple million dollars in revenue. That's awesome. And if somebody wants to do that, we applaud you. That's the lifeblood of the American economy there. Ventures are a totally different animal. Who you are today gets to shift to close the gap between who you are today and somebody that has to build something that's worth a uh, billion dollars. Again, go back to the whole Sarah Blakely example. What she was willing to do door to door, get thrown out of entire, you know, office towers in New York because she was willing to go sell her ass off. Who's the kind of person that does that? The kind of person that's freaking obsessed. <coughs> right. So guys, everybody, everybody is buying you as a founder. The funders, the clients, and your recruits. You're always raising money. You're always selling and marketing to your clients, and you're always recruiting your team. That team is counting on you to be a leader. If you're not an awesome leader, they're not gonna come work for the company, no matter what the benefits are financially. All right, the biggest thing I need from an investor is their money. True or false? I would say false. You guys, don't partner with somebody just for their money. You're making a mistake. If, if you feel like it's not a good fit, or their attitude is that you, know, you need me, Listen very carefully to what your gut's saying. A great investor is over the, they're, they're over the moon excited to invest with you. They know a lot of things and they know a lot of people. Their network is very, very, very critical to the success of your startup. And I think it's not inappropriate, don't do this in the beginning, please. To ask the funder what their plan is to daisy chain you to the next capital situation. Now, it is not just on them, it's on you. Because you are the person driving the boat. But if, no, no funder wants to be the last check into your startup. So I don't think it's inappropriate to ask, what is your plan outside of my efforts to make sure that I get to the next capital liquidity situation? And they need to be coming to help daisy chain that because the odds are they're more sophisticated than their network and their ability to understand fundraising than you are. But it's on you to be as fundraising fluent as you can possibly be. Okay, just a couple more. I think we already covered how far in advance it should be raising capital, like nine months ago. <laughs> what, is the, what is a major source of limited partner capital for VCs? What's the major source of limited partner capital for VCs? I've already asked this question, just, just driving it home. Yes, yeah, sometimes family offices, sometimes okay. private equity, and also the Fortune 2000. Just get that ensconced in your mind. The capital game is rigged, and I can't rig it for myself and in my favor. True or false? The capital game is rigged, first of all, true or false, and I cannot rig it in my favor. True or false? The first answer is it is absolutely rigged, 100%, 100%. There's an entire ecosystem that create a network effect around the founders, and Vegas is not one of them. We are creating that. So what that means is if you're gonna build a startup here, know that you have to create that network effect for yourself. Network effect means the more capital, the more partnerships, the more opportunities for clients that are in a system, the better the system gets and the more rewarding it is for who it supports inside of that ecosystem. There's a reason why New York, Boston, and, and Silicon Valley punch at that level, because they have created a crazy network effect of founder funders and success and talent that gets pulled in with high salaries and success and working on amazing problems that everyone's excited about. Guys, think about this for a minute. 
Mike and I travel the world. You guys know that there are billion dollar companies that were birthed just to compete with Uber. I'm in South America, Uber's illegal in some of those countries, and yet they have billion dollar companies that came to rise just to compete with Uber. So think about the, the, the effect that that creates. Okay, so I believe very strongly that the capital game is rigged, 100%. It may not be fair, it may not be fair that the education and the access to the capital and the getting allocation of capital is evenly distributed, it's not. But that doesn't mean we can't change that by knowledge and access and understanding and being a startup ninja. You know, showing up as an entrepreneur that's going to figure it out and willing to do the work. And if you guys are confused, what book should I read? The best books on funding are not about funding. The best books on funding are about how entire industries and verticals were funded. And all you got to do is follow the money trail, follow the incentives, follow how did Korea create Samsung? What did the Huawei founder do to copy the Samsung founder? He just created the same exact experience. Then, of course, he had China back then. So you built something even bigger. All right, investors only want to take my equity and take over my company. True or false? Not even the credits. What are you saying? Not even the right investors. Guys, it is. I, I don't know if Mike's been through this yet. We, we have a thing called a workout. A workout is when we have to come into a company and, and clean house, and it is ugly. It is not fun for a funder. It's the worst. It's the worst nightmare to have a founder that leaves, or that we have to kick out, or and in, in most cases you can't necessarily kick out a founder. You have a debt structure with them, you can. I've had to do workouts more than I'd like to admit, which means I made a mistake and then I had to correct it. I made a mistake in investing in that founder. Uh, maybe they were coachable. Maybe they thought that the money would never run out. You know, any, any number of things. It is, guys, we're not operators. When we're investors, we are counting on you to be the operator. So this fear of like, they're going to take my company, take my idea, nobody cares. The worst nightmare for a funder is for the founder to not be able to get the ball in the hole. And so they don't want to take your equity. And many VCs that are smart know that if you're left at the end of a series D round with less than say 20%, 16% of your company, then you're not going to be motivated. So smart VCs look at the, feel free to join us, it's nice to have you. Uh, they understand that the founder is the X factor, guys. They're looking for that unicorn founder to take it back. All right, thanks, buddy. us as general partners of the fund if they think we're making bad financial decisions for them. 
So just think about that. And if you can raise capital in other interesting forms, which Kurt is gonna, Kurt is gonna talk about, I highly recommend it. Kurt actually talks about bringing on strategic investors to help you daisy chain to the next round of funding. A lot of times we're helping our companies go to that seed series A and beyond. But more important than that, we're actually looking, we help them find alternative sources of funding. I was speaking with a founder outside, another really great resource. For those of you that are actually building anything, going through the R&D and product development cycle, I recommend not by through funding in the form of government grants. So a helpful resource is uh, Turbo SBIR and um, SBIR and STTR. There are billions of dollars available in government grants in the three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, to help companies get into government contracts. When people think government, they automatically think DOD. This is NIH, NSF, DOT, DOE. If you're building anything that can be used by the government in any way, they will give you hundreds of thousands of dollars at first and then millions of dollars later to help develop it and then get it into government contracts. They're ready to jump through hoops though. Yes. There is no perfect capital type. Totally, that, this is again one example. The, the website I gave you, don't buy the thing, do the free search tool. It's kind of like Turbo's, it helps you search for, here are all the different grants that are out there. And again, as Kurt always says, it's DYOR, just like you never do your own research, see if that's a good option for you. And again, it's non-dilutive in nature, meaning you don't give up any equity, you're getting grants. It does take time, and there are, you know, you may have to tweak your development this pipeline. Is the reason why we call it a capital stack, guys, is the reason why we call it capital sequencing, is what's the sequence of different capital types over time, different partnerships over time, for me to get this where my stated goal is, whether it's an IPO, an exit, or whatever. Exactly. Um, last two things I'll touch on on the commercial break, and then I'll get into green flags, red flags, make sure we have enough time for everything else is um, Kurt talked about the investor update. He says, well, if they're not a fit for me right now, he made a really good point. Relationships are everything. I mean, again, I've known Kurt for 10 years. I'm long on everything I do. I hope that you are as a founder, as a capital allocator as well. This, by its nature, is a very long game. Make sure that you're developing relationships for the long term, not for short term transactional. I have had the founders that kind of jump right into your inbox, go for the kill right away, and then the moment you say it's not a fit right now, it doesn't mean no forever, it means not right now, they decide, okay, you're not important to me. And we all take note of that. We as investors talk all the time, especially if you're in kind of the same industry. So work on building those kinds of relationships. Best way to do that is there's a resource called paperstreet.vc. These are just investor updates. Again, don't do the paid thing, you can just do the template version of it. What I recommend all founders do is send out consistent updates. Anyone that you've spoken with at the end of your 20 minute chat with them, ask them, can I add you to my update list? I get it all the time, founders on a monthly, on a quarterly basis, I'll just see those updates, it's in the back of my mind, and then six months, nine months later, when they're going out and raising capital, even if it's not for me, I may point them in the direction of Kurt, hey, here are some helpful ways I can do this. It's a good way of establishing relationships. Of course, ask for permission. But paperstreet.bc gives you a really simple template, like accomplishments, highlights, low likes, traction, ask. Again, one of the big mistakes, and I'll like a little uh, foreshadowing into red flags, it's not about being fluffy, about getting updates that don't have any substance. As investors, we're also looking for the meat and potatoes. Tell me how you're actually doing. Tell me how many customers you're talking to. Tell me how much growth has happened over the last three months. Capital cadence. Good, the cadence. If I see a founder consistently hitting milestone every month, every quarter, that's a founder I want to back. Last thing I'll say uh, on the risk versus rewards in kind of that life cycle of um, capital allocation that I mentioned, and then I'll give some uh, red flags and green flags. But as you can kind of tell, when you first start something, the upside of that is huge. Remember, friends and family, angel investors, upside is huge. When we're talking upside, we're talking like 100,000x plus potential because it's so early, but also the risk is incredibly massive, right? Is this a founder to actually pull it off? A lot of assumptions built in, having validated their assumptions. As you move further and further into the life cycle, the cycle of the company and the valuations start increasing, the risk starts going down, but the returns and the potential for the multiples start going down as well. Does that make sense? So the later you get, I talked about, you know, pre-seed, seed, series A and beyond. Once you're in the growth stage of private equity, they're looking for like one and a half to maybe three X at the most. 
the stage at which we bet on, which most of you, when you're going out and raising that first round of capital, is 100x. So I want you to kind of understand that that's the lens to look through. Again, this is through a VC lens. We are looking for 100x potential. Every company we invest in, should they have the potential to go there? Like Kurt mentioned, it's also very important to understand your type of business. Is it a lifestyle business that you can just go out and have a few million dollars a year and live a great life? Amazing, that is really, really great. A lot of companies are doing that. As Kurt says, it's the backbone of the American economy. That's very different than a venture backbone business. So I also want you to kind of, in the back of your mind, think, what is the goal of my business? Is this the 100X? Do I want to grow as this unicorn billion dollar plus company? Or do I want to have, you know, like it make, it make the impact I want to make running the type of business? There are businesses that are $10 million a year and they're more capital efficient than a company that's 100 million and squeak them by a, a small, a, a small, you know, margin. You just have to know that. You have to decide where am I really at? Be honest with yourself about what am I really willing to do to get there? Because the guys, this is a marathon and sprints inside of a marathon. We're talking the kind of stress you can't imagine. There's a founder buddy of mine that exited for 800 million to eBay. Sounds nice, right? He said, I got the bright idea that I would start collecting feedback from my 600 employees and I would let them tell me exactly what they were thinking and feeling. I cried myself to sleep for months because of the pressure and the expectations and not these families I'm supporting. You just gotta understand, how are you wired? What are you willing to do? How are you willing to shift and, and up level? Yep, awesome. Um, to Kurt's point, let me get into some green flags and red flags. I'm gonna start with red flags, just because it's the easiest thing. Because this is a game of relationships, it's a game of being long, integrity, to me, is like that's the single way to sum it up. If I find a lack of integrity in a founder, which unfortunately, in the last several years, is if we see it in the last five to seven years of angel investing, is more common than I wish I would admit. Integrity off of that. I think things like Shark Tank and those shows have like made, uh, have bred some level of inflation that I think isn't healthy, and I'll elaborate on that. Founders feel like they need to tell an amazing story, they need to pump everything, they need to pretend like everything is amazing in their company and they're doing incredible. Whereas if they come and approach it very honestly and let me know where they are, I can help kind of trigger and, and point them in the right direction even if it's not a fit for us. The way investment works is they come to us, they tell us a story. If we like it, we kind of move them through the process and eventually we do what's called DD, due diligence, where we look under the hood and we're looking at everything in their data room. Something for you all to think about. You'll also need this when you go out and secure other types of capital, not the leader otherwise. When we start going into DD and looking under the hood, we when we start seeing things that don't match up with the story they told us. We have this much revenue, and then I'm looking at their balance sheet, I'm looking at their, we look at bank statements and all that. The amount of uh, dishonesty is shocking. And so let me just tell you right up front, please, like there's one thing to be a good storyteller, and by all means, I think every good company needs someone that's passionate telling the story. But do not, do not, do not, just like Kurtz, ever, 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 do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, ever, ever, ever be dishonest. Whether it's with anyone that you're working with, your peers, founders, or investors, because it's a small world, and they'll tarnish your reputation for the rest of the time. The and truth always reputation. comes out, always. They will find out, I can promise you. We will always find out, always. I am totally okay with the company coming to me saying, we have $500 in MRR, $500 in don't tell me you had 25K in MRR when it under the hood. That was one service-based contract that you did that's not even part of the fundamental business model and there aren't actually big users there. So just be honest. That's like the biggest red flag to me is dishonesty. As far as green flags go, the flip to that, the counter is high integrity. If I can tell that this is a founder, I ask every founder why they're building what they're building. Because again, this is a long journey. It's not how do I do this in a year and out, we're talking on average, right? Our fun life is 10 years. On average, liquidity events, especially if you're investing in real estate, happen in like years five to seven or so. But plan on whatever you're building to be doing for at least five years, probably longer. You better have a deep why to what you're building. You better like actually care about what you're building because yeah, there are fun days, but they're more often than not, they're incredibly challenging days. Even in my world as an investor, someone asked me the other day, is it easier being a founder or investor? 
actually like, whew, yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough one, I'll share my answer later, but all I said is you better have a deep why, because when you wake up and, or it's like 2 a.m. and you're sending off emails, like there will be a million reasons to quit, and if you, have that, if you don't have that deep burning like reason for doing what you're doing and connecting to purpose, you will quit for sure. And so what I look for in founders is that drive, that kind of insatiable curiosity. They love what they're doing and this thing needs to exist. Of course, beyond that, as you start to build out a team, you need the technical expertise, you need to have the domain expertise, you need to de-risk this and give me confidence that this thing and the team is going to exist. So that's very high level like from an integrity standpoint. I think I'll pause there for like green flags and red flags. There's a bunch of other things as we get into the details of diligence, into like what kinds of business models. Um, but yeah, how's that? Great. I That's awesome. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna do uh, have have you. So we have an option. Choose your own adventure. Okay. So we can do. Uh, we can have somebody come up and, and hot seat pitch, and we can do some uh, you know uh, feedback on that pitch. And feedback is always helpful to improve. Or we could do some Q and A. You guys can ask us some questions. Which do you prefer? In the time we have, our hot seat. Hot seat. Who's ready to hot seat pitch? Z, you ready to pitch? No? Okay, she's passing. I got to do Q&A. Okay, okay. Teach me, teach me how to pitch. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to pitch. No, no, I don't want to pitch. I want to pitch. Okay. So, when I can't pitch, but my company's like super esoteric, so it's up to you. Well, if you can't aren't, aren't they at all? One thing, I get it. As far as pitches go, also what I would recommend for everyone is always have your elevator pitch. Have a quick, this is what I do in a sentence, like this is what my company does. Have a 60 second pitch ready to go. That's no slides or anything. You're just talking, literally the elevator. We're going from first floor to 15th floor, got 60 seconds. Have a three minute pitch with slides. You do 12 slides, problem solution, blah, blah, I'll tell you more about that later if you're interested. And then you're longer by 10 plus. The goal of the 60 second, what you're about to see here, or a three minute one, is really two things. Number one, you want the investor to say, tell me more, AKA, I want to, I want to set up a second meeting with you. That's the goal. The other outcome that people don't talk about that I think is maybe even more important, is I should be able to tell exactly what he does to all my investor friends and articulate it very clearly based on what he told me. Hey, I just talked to this guy that's putting data centers on the moon. That's one of our companies, by the way. They're putting data centers on the moon next month. Can't sure why SpaceX. It's wild. It's so cool. But like how, like in one sentence, company, data centers on the moon. I can go tell a lot of other people what they're doing. So think about that. Does your 60 seconds articulate exactly what you do? Encourage a second meeting for them if they're interested and allow them to go tell others what you do. That's the goal. I'm gonna get there. I think it's All right, so I'm gonna start things off. It's, it's a little less targeted than I'm used to, so I'm gonna start things off with a filter. I want everyone to stick their hand up. All right, now if you have heard of Bitcoin, if you have not heard of Bitcoin, put your hand down. All right, so mortgage it. If you haven't heard of uh, cryptocurrency, put your hand down. If you haven't heard of Coinbase or FTX, put your hand down. If you haven't heard of how FTX lost ten trillion dollars, or sorry, ten billion dollars of customer funds, put your hand down. Wow. Okay, that's great. So my company is called Deep Waters. We're here to solve that problem. Uh, Deep Waters is the world's first provably transparent and fair crypto exchange. So what that means is we have the full feature set, all the bells and whistles of something like an FTX or a Coinbase, but our tech stack is built in a way where we cannot FTX you. That means that. Everything is completely transparent. We're not this kind of like walled garden approach like every other player in the industry. And we're really just trying to build a healthy ecosystem and like expand crypto and, and the use case in the world. And that's what we do. Real for money, there would be an ask. Okay, awesome. I know you know this space pretty well. So, what's your feedback? And then we'll we maybe get some feedback from you guys. Yeah, first, I, I love how we started that, yes. the audience interaction. Yes. I love that he, obviously, with everyone's hands still raised, like you're, you're making that connection, they understand it. I understand very clearly what he does. The 
one little tweak, you already talked about it, have, always have an ask at the end, even if you're pitching. So if you're live on a mission, come talk to me. Or if you're an investor in the room, come find me in the corner. Always, always, always have an ask. Call to action. Call it, always in a call to action, even if it's not asking for money. By the way, a lot of times if you ask for advice, you get money. If you yeah. ask for money, you get advice. So think about that. Ask for advice, generally kind of gets you in the door. <laughs> the only thing I would tweak about that is he said, he used the word try to pitch. I don't know if he caught it. He said, we are trying to do this. I have too many founders that tell me that. We are building this. Give me the confidence as an investor that you and the team are the ones to execute on. If you can add five or 10 seconds of your background of why you're building this and why you have the team to pull it off and actually execute on it, I think it would make it that much stronger, but a very definitive, this is what we're doing. But other than that, like, what Either get with me on LinkedIn 
or tell us about your business on Built By. We have a bunch of amazing events that are coming up. We're building an entire full-on podcast studio in the backyard of the property over in the Henderson area uh, to be showcasing amazing uh, content across entrepreneurship and funders and all of that. We're gonna be doing a lot of impact work, which is part of what brought Mike and I together. Mike has been taking people on impact trips to build houses and schools all over the world. That sounds like really interesting, very important work and fun. If you want to learn more about that, go to greatmisventures.com. And every quarter, the team goes down to Mexico and takes people and you guys get to build houses for people living on dirt floors that have nothing. It's a really amazing perspective to have come be part of the greatest team and have that experience. Okay, so we'll see you build by all that. Okay, guys, questions? Go ahead. Okay, so this one goes for you and I think everyone else. There's a big difference, I feel, between decision making and discernment. What comes from the heart comes from logic. And they said that the human uh, executes best on their purpose and mission and their alignment. We can have a great mix of both, but the most important thing is when to use it and when to not, and it's not the go, right? So not only should you ask that, you should talk to some of the other founders. And they should not be afraid to do that because if they know if they've done great work and it's been a great partnership, they're gonna get a growing response. Another thing I'll just add to that is a distinction since you and I have been having this conversation around some of the choices that we're making about who we invite into the SEBA system that we need to be protective. Guys, we have a very marketable asset here. We have a market here that many people want to be a part of. They need to be bringing something to the barbecue if they're gonna come and hang out. The distinction I'll give is, is I don't believe judgment does us many favors when it comes to human beings. Because it, it says I'm better than you or I'm different than you and I don't like you. And I don't think judgment is, is very appropriate. It's something that we need to look at because I'm, I'm learning as, as I get older that there's all these shades of judgment that we sometimes don't realize we have, these lenses that we, we view things through, right? Especially when we're trying to create more opportunity and access. On the flip side, I believe discernment, which is the other counter to that, is absolutely appropriate. There are friends that like to say to me, you don't care if you uh, have friends that aren't business owners. That's correct. I don't mind. I want to be around moonshot takers and game changers because iron sharpens iron. I want to be around people that produce more than they consume and generally that's what entrepreneurs do. I don't, if I've got mountain bike buddies and things like that and whatever, I, I, I all attract great people, I love that. But I have zero issues with being very discerning about who comes into my inner circle. Guys, you have startups, you're up against the clock. You have to be incredibly careful about the environment that you allow to surround yourself with because it will determine your trajectory. And the number one thing that makes up that experience is the people around you. That's what creates community, that's what creates environment. It's super, super, super important. Judgment versus discernment. And try to be discerning at all times if I can. To piggyback off that, everyone sort of quote, you're the average of the five people you spend most time with. As you get older, at least for me, I realize that's more and more. It's like being incredibly discerning of who you spend your time with. It's probably the people that inspire you before you have all that the motivation side. The practical side to answer your question on the investors is don't ask, you can ask them, tell me about your investments. They shouldn't even have them listed. They're gonna tell you their best ones. And those founders are gonna love them because they succeeded. I actually think it's more interesting. I'm saying this on the other side of the table to the VC. Go on Crunchbase and see who they've invested in that's failed. And then reach out to those founders and ask, what was your relationship with that investor when things were going wrong? Because everyone's happy when the money's flowing and everyone's doing well. And venture is a game of moonshots. It's a game of the power law, where one company in the fund is gonna return the entire fund to the investors. I'm more interested in how do they navigate the relationships with companies and founders that are struggling. Gary. Uh, it's great. Oh, my bad. Yeah. So, sorry. Uh, so it goes the other way too. I know because we've gone through multiple rounds and as we proceed further, the investors are going to ask you the same thing. They're going to ask for references. They're going to want to talk to your other investors if they already know them. Um, and it's definitely expected that you're doing your homework. 100%. And in fact, I told you about the one space company we invested in, but it's called Don't Start Your Ears Off, something like this up on the moon. We're diligent, late, late stage with another uh, space company. And what we're doing is we're, uh, we kind of created a coalition of other VCs that all want to come in this round. And we're um, using, kind of sharing diligence together and talking to previous investors. So 100% it goes the other way, but they will talk to, as part of a reference check, 
not only people on your team, people that invested in you previously, the companies you've worked with as part of our diligence process. Again, if we're going to be writing 250 k up to a million dollars, we want to know that you're the founder of the team that executes on this. So be prepared to kind of have your stuff dug up. Um, and I encourage you to do the same with people you bring into your orbit. Question. Hey, what we're talking about the alternatives to raising capital by trying to grants. Do you recommend just to put the research and come back in that way, or do you have a specific resource for people that get a grant? So you got to understand grants come in different shapes and sizes. So there's federal level, right? And I believe SBIR Turbo is one of the best places to do that. But when you start getting into state level, or even local level, or even county level, the tends to be a kind of thing where you have to actually go look in, in different places because it's not as, as present on some of those larger platforms. And find a grant writer that really understands grant writing because the grant process is both writing for the grant and then you have to do reporting and a number of other things. So there's there's quite a bit, as any specific capital type has an art and a science to it, there's quite a bit to grants. They're not, it's not free money other than the fact that it technically is our money in the first place, right? Um, I just wrote for a massive grant, first time I'd ever done anything of that scope and size, based on all the study that we're doing. You know, Mike, one of the things I love about Mike is he's a very high learner. Every time I meet him, I know that he's leveling up and learning new things. I had to go back to school as a funder of 17 years and start challenging what I thought I knew about capital. And uh, I'm happy to say that it looks like we've got a real shot at a very, very substantial grant on behalf of the Vegas venture ecosystem. We'll know in a couple of months. Um, again, capital cadence, capital sequencing, capital stack, we're not going to know for a couple of months. So it's like you got to be keeping multiple things moving at the same time. Yeah, agreed. And with ChatGPT4, the new beta 2 connects with web browsing, so it doesn't end its corpus of data at the end of 2021. You can actually put it into GPT4. This is the kind of business I'm building. What are the best grants on a uh, local, state, federal level um, that can help me at this stage of my company? Utilize, utilize AI. AI is totally not there yet with all these alternative capital types, just to be clear, guys. It, it, the language isn't even on the internet for a lot of it, so just know that. The number one place, and I, as soon as I find others, I will certainly let you know, but you should be following my LinkedIn content. It's, it is that good when it comes to, like, I've been spending years researching this stuff, learning about it, having to become experts, verifying, validating, understanding the transactions that are happening in the space. This is not debatable. This is fact, this is history, okay? So just know that. Questions? Um, can you speak to it in a nutshell of what may be some of the pros and cons of taking on some private investors versus giving the power to the people and doing the crowdfunding approach? Sure, the dirty secret of crowdfunding is you gotta have a crowd. Right. If you don't have a list, None of the, I mean, we have all the best relationships with crowdfunders. So you can come to me and I can tell you very quickly if you're a good fit for that. Some of the biggest crowdfunders were actually present at the Build by Nevada event that we just had on Tuesday night. Uh, literally the biggest one in, in the country. Um, but number one, just understand crowdfunding is not some magical thing, it's marketing. It's a story with the right video and the right narrative to an audience that's likely to buy. So understand that. Number two, my opinion is that product crowdfunding is proven in the market that the market is ready and is willing to accept product crowdfunding. I have guided people in the spice community to where they raised a million six off of some basic information that I've given them. Whereas I believe that the market has not yet signaled that we have arrived at other than real estate at a time where it's ready to support full sale equity crowdfunding. Now he might have a different opinion, he's buddies with the we funder guys, but I don't believe we're there yet. I am very positive on these, this idea that it's going to grow and increase to where it's more possible to do more raises and you'll start seeing siloed specific crowdfunding groups where they just do this little slice of the pie and they're amazing at it. And we're starting to see that. Yeah, so for those that aren't familiar, really two types of crowdfunding. There's rewards-based crowdfunding and product-based crowdfunding. And Kurt said you're not giving up equity. You're essentially, uh, it works well for CPG companies where you're selling pre-orders or you're using it for production, pre-production. Then there's equity-based crowdfunding and the three based platforms that are Star Engine, Republic, and We Funder. Um, they do work well, depending on the industry. As Kurt said, the dirty secret is you must have a crowd. Two things to note. Uh, first of all, they raised the limit from 1.07 million up to $5 million was a few years ago, maybe a little bit longer. So now you can raise up to five million, and I've seen many companies do it for well. Two things to take note of. First is uh, do not set predatory terms. 
because in general, what it means is you're raising from quote unquote unsophisticated investors, you're raising from unaccredited investors, and I've seen too many companies say that we're valuing ourselves at 25 to 50 million dollars and everyone can come in at a thousand dollars. Yeah, that'll work for that round because people don't really ask too many questions because they're not sophisticated investors. When you try to go out and raise real capital in the future, you're all of a sudden having to do what's called a down round, saying, well, we raised it this previously, but now we look at this. So the that's, VCs will price it and say, no, 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 no. And that's it's down round. And that's when we look unfavorably as investors upon equity crowdfunding. It's not always the case, but in general, if you're going to use it, use it well. Also, again, I best friends with head of partnerships. We fund her and Maria and head of partnerships at Republic. I know those that really well. You must have about 50% in commitments from your own community. It's a great way because it turns your community also into evangelists. They want to own a piece of the company. I'm sure it's a small piece, but they get to say, hey, I'm a part owner. So they actually go out and kind of market on your behalf. Hey, I'm a part owner in this company. It's very cool. But if you don't have about 50%, that's when it tips the scales and then they can turn on their community of accredited and non-accredited investors for public we butter to help close out the rest of the round. They do have a, what's called a test the waters campaign too where you can kind of see how much interest there is. But in general, I would kind of precede it if you're planning on doing this. Uh, like talking to people, get some verbal commits. If I end up doing a $5,000 raise, will you come in for X amount? Guys, so, it, you usually have to have about 50 grand. It's not free up front. So for California, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $5,000, $
that brings championships, that creates championship teams that can do things that are just mind blowing and make up for whatever the weaknesses are that the founder has to go on. Sorry to double down on this, it's just so important. Kurt knows the story. Uh, a dear friend of mine, his name is John Asseroff, he was in the movie The Secret, if you guys ever saw that. I think that's, for a lot of people, like games of the personal development world, that's their first introduction. They're like, I know The Secret. It's interesting, we sat down and like, made, like a long 10 years ago, did a Facebook Live, and we titled it, uh, How the Law of Attraction Hurt More People Than It Helped. Because that's the way, if you haven't read The Secret, that's what it is, Law of Attraction. And the reason he said it is, yeah, Law of Attraction is great. Thing, man, and all things. But what the book doesn't talk about, he said this. <laughs> it's like the secret guy. He says it's the law of Goya. And I was like, Goya, what do you mean? He's like, get off your ass. <laughs> like, so, like, yes, think it, dream it, believe it, alchemize it, but get off your butt and actually make it happen because that's the business. So, so, something else I'll say on this too, guys, is, is you, one of the biggest questions, and I'll probably have to write a whole post about this that a founder should be asking is who do I get to be? Who do I get to become? Who do I get to be in order to create a company that does exactly what it is that I want to create? The onus is back on you. You're the powerful creator. Are you bigger or not? I said this in my post uh, yesterday or today, whichever one it was. Are you bigger or not than your circumstances at the end of the day? So who do you get to become? Who do you get to be? That's the predominant energy you should be in. There are no excuses. At the end of the day, you're a founder. You're an entrepreneur. It comes from the French to create something from nothing. And so one of the things I find is that founders get too caught up in, well, the market's doing this. Look, guys, I'm gonna say this. We're, we're in for a very bumpy ride in the next couple of years. You need to know that, economically speaking. It's coming. And so the economy might be bad, it might be challenging, it might be distressed, it might be whatever. This is also when Airbnb and Uber were created in the last cycle. Also, just because the economy's bad doesn't mean your economy you ultimately decide that. Because here's what I know. Founders being the X factor, you attract capital. Great projects, great founders, they always find a way and they always attract capital. Sometimes it requires, well actually always, it requires more time and more pitching and more inefficiency than it should. And that's something that my team is actively working on is streamlining and simplifying the fundraising process. Creating a capital assembly line where that proximity to capital is automated. It's a massive project that's taken me over 10 years to even understand the problem, much less even figure out a solution for it. Just understand, you guys are the X factor. So before you get frustrated at the economy or the VCs or whoever, look at yourself and say, how am I showing up? What work have I done on myself, both spiritually uh, and, and personally and otherwise? Because at the end of the day, you're, you're the most valuable tool and, and weapon in that arsenal. And I don't see enough accountability and ownership coming from founders about that. I wrote a post a couple of, Days ago, man, people were up in arms because I was telling everybody that VCs and funders were buying you. And they thought I meant like actually buying you. <laughs> I'm like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but we are buying you. And so you need to buy yourself first. And how do you show up for that? Questions? Anybody else? I just have something to share when you said about the person that you're going to become. Before you can do that, you have to know who you are and whether you. Founders are exiting. 
Our I-15 here in Vegas looks very different than the I-15 in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is minting at a record pace for a market that's a third the age of the big mature markets. More unicorn founders than anywhere else in the country, and it's not on the, on the coast. So it's really unique in that way. So we're counting on you guys, and we're also doing the work behind the scenes to produce founder funders and, and these, what I call show pony talent companies, where other founders look at what you're doing and say, oh my gosh, I can do that too. And it starts to create this effect that's, that's pretty incredible, where companies are exiting at a shorter time frame. That's not to say it's not a tremendous amount of work, it doesn't have risk, it doesn't require you to shift from who you are today to something else tomorrow. Any final words?